Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the presentation of County Executive Mark Elrich's uh, 2022 uh, recommended budget. Um, I want to remind uh, those folks of the press, uh, if you need permission to record, please indicate so in the chat. Um, and as, after we are done with the presentation, if you do have questions for the county executive, uh, please indicate your news organization in the chat uh, and that you wanna ask a question as well. And we'll go ahead and make sure that we do that for you. In addition to that, we will be uh, sending out to you uh, copies of the budget highlights uh, as well as the budget message. Uh, so you'll have those for your reports. Um, so without further ado, I am going to hand things over to County Executive Mark Elridge as we start our budget day presentation. So um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm happy to be here and um, give you a chance to uh, see what's in store in this new budget. I, I just wanna start by saying, you know, it is hard to say what we knew last spring was gonna be the future of Montgomery County over the next year. Um, we've gone through, uh, I think, you know, obviously a really difficult year. We've been dealing with, you know, the pandemic. It has had major impacts on, on how we work in the county. Um, I think back on the early days, and I remember back in May, we were talking about, are we gonna open for the 4th of July? You remember our first financial package was assistance for the last two weeks of March and April. And I think everybody was just looking at the calendar and thinking, is this going to get better and we, are we going to be opening up? And I think everybody assumed that we would go the same way that um, has happened in China and that opening would occur a lot quicker. And opening obviously did not occur a lot quicker. Fourth of July did not happen last year. Um, the challenges of this budget are pretty clear. We've had um, COVID-19. Um, it's still with us. Uh, we know the effects will linger on even as we get to the, the actual disease more under control. Certainly the economic effects are going to limit, are going to um, prevail beyond the end of the, uh, of the major threat from the virus itself. Uh, we are still in a state of emergency. We've lost 1,400 lives in Montgomery County. Uh, more than 65,000 county residents have contracted COVID. And though many have recovered, almost all have recovered, many um, you know, are suffering continuing side effects from the infection. And back in the spring, we were given some very dire physical projections um, that would have indicated you know, major losses in revenue and major um, uh, inability to deal with uh, the reserves in the county. And the good news is not all of that materialized. So this is about response, recovery, and resilience. We're gonna break this presentation into these three parts. We'll start with response. Um, our response, we, we put in place immediately a hiring and procurement freeze, probably the first in the state, one of the first in the country, and we just said we're freezing hiring and procurement. The only exceptions to hiring were essential personnel and the only exceptions to procurement were what we needed to deal with the virus. And that is highlighted in the bullet below. We put $50 million into PPE and cleaning supplies, $13 million to prepare hospitals and buy ventilators. We made sure we had money and that we had PPE in place. I remember in the beginning of this, um, people were buying supplies and they were buying them on a relatively short um, future timeline. And I just told my staff I wanted supplies bought now for the second round and possible third round. Um, I had no doubt that this was um, gonna come back again. I think every indication was that it would come back and that we needed to be prepared of it, for it. You know, Montgomery County, like the rest of the country, was not ready when COVID hit. We've never had to be ready for something like this. I wanted to make sure that we were able to put things in place um, so that when the rounds two came, that we would not be looking for masks and sanitizer. Uh, we administered um, 1.4 million tests and we're still testing. 
we put a between the current year and um, the end of the last fiscal year and going into the next fiscal year, we'll have $150 million for residents and rental assistance and income support. We've put out 17 million meals prepared and delivered by MCPS and our community partners. We've put out 8.2 million pounds of food distributed with our nonprofit partners. We set up eight service hubs throughout the county and <clears throat> the service hubs are gonna be one of the enduring things that comes out of this budget because when we were um, trying to figure out how best to reach the diverse communities in the county and realizing that we were not getting as deep into these communities as we needed to, um, the service hubs got created and we found that by working with our nonprofit partners, we were able to be more effective in the community and this is something that's going to carry forward to our work as we go forward post pandemic. We provided $70 million to businesses and nonprofits. And we announced the start of business relief on March 20th, 2020. So we were already at the very beginning of this, thinking about what are we going to have to do to help people get through this crisis. We have vaccinated 228,000 residents with at least one dose. 25% of the adult population um, has had one shot and more than 60% of the 65 of residents 65 um, and up um, have had um, one vaccine, one shot of the vaccine. The American Rescue Plan is providing $203 million and we have left in this budget $82 million that is unallocated. That means the council and I will work together to determine what are the best uses of the money going forward. There's a lot of uncertainty going into the new year about what holes we may have to plug. And so this money will be available for us to make decisions with. Our, our colleges and the Montgomery County Public Schools have $400 million in addition to federal funds um, beyond um, their existing budget. So we have fully funded the um, the budgets for the school system without this $400 million. This is additional funding going to the schools and Montgomery College. We know that we're also um, looking at what will probably be a K-shaped recovery. I know people heard, you know, V-shaped and then there was the Nike swoosh. Now it appears to be K-shaped and the importance of the K is that there are two um, angular arms that make up the K. The one at the top is the recovery. And we expect that for many businesses, recovery will be pretty rapid and pretty complete. On the other hand, we know that for another sector, hospitality in particular, restaurants, hotels, and the like, that recovery is going to be slow and painful. And we know that there are going to be businesses that are lost to COVID that will not come back. So the recovery is gonna be slower for people in the downward facing line and it'll be faster for people in the upward facing line. Um, and we're prepared and we're you know, gonna be continue to be ready to help people um, who need help from the county. Next. Hello. So the FY22 budget highlights, we fully fund MCPS and the Montgomery College budget requests. We have supports for families and vulnerable residents. We've enhanced funding for early care and education. We provide a record level of funding for affordable housing and reimagining public safety is beginning and we're starting to restructure the police and enhance mental health services and our crisis responses. Next. Is the slide Sorry, next? Bob. 
is sticking. That's why it won't move. Hold on. Okay, this budget is the first budget where, where our departments began applying an equity ends, lens to their work, um, evaluating programs for the impact on the community and make sure that uh, what we're doing is uh, relates to the community that is Montgomery County in its entirety. Uh, we're making strides in addressing climate change and promoting mass transit. I'll take a little side note here that uh, I was the one that put together the school system with uh, the idea of doing leasing and we brought them together with uh, one of the companies that um, was offering to lease the school system electric buses. I was intrigued by this proposition because um, they were able to lower the cost of the actual buses by the private sector being able to take advantage of the depreciation and the tax credits. Um, I think as everybody realizes, Tax, rec tax credits and depreciation are worthless to the county government in terms of revenue. Um, we can't take a tax credit, we don't get tax credits and uh, we can't depreciate our assets and, uh, and save our expenses. So by finding a partner who takes part of their payment in the form of depreciation and tax credits, we're able to make, bring the prices of the buses down to a more reasonable place. And we're really encouraged that this is a model we're looking to use for both our own bus fleet and also for our vehicle fleet in the county in general. We um, have set up two committees to deal with um, economic recovery, one that focused on the short term, how do we get out of COVID, and the other focusing on how do we move this county forward. We've uh, boosted our county reserves to 9.6%. I, you know, many of you may remember dire predictions about the reserves coming nowhere close to this, but we're at 9.6% and there are no new taxes and OPEV is fully funded in this budget. Next slide. Funding for education, as I've said, we fully funded the Board of Education's $2.8 billion request, fully funded Montgomery College's three. $312.5 million request. We're expanding our Montgomery Can Code program and innovation hub in partnership with Apple. And we're supporting the Kid Museum efforts for hands-on STEM learning. Next. We are tackling climate change. Last year's budget, of course, turned into a same services budget because of COVID. Um, this year, we're moving forward. We've got additional staff in the budget to work on cl climate change programs in the Department of Environmental Protection, working on energy policy management for both government buildings and in order to help the private sector manage their transition. Uh, we have vehicle electrification. Again, um, we're looking to help consumers in the county switch to electric and we're also willing to work with uh, private sector companies and with our own fleets to convert them to electric. One of the innovative things I think you'll be seeing is the use for example of lighting poles as also electric vehicle charging stations and we are put money in the budget for community outreach because this is only going to happen with the buy-in and participation of the community. I can have all the policies I want that favor you know, solar on rooftops and electric vehicles. But if people don't do these things, then we will not be able to achieve our goals. So we need both a government that's willing to lead on this and we need an informed electorate that's willing to make their own decisions, personal decisions that help us get there. Remembering of course, that this isn't about the government and it's not about us as individuals. It's really about what kind of world and planet we're gonna leave for our children and our grandchildren. And I think this is something everybody can get behind. Um, we've made enhancements to the Tree Montgomery program, the Rainscapes program, and the watershed grants. We're funding studies to revise the uh, ride on transit network as we start to implement bus rapid transit and design bus rapid transit. Our ride on network is going to change. The long hauls are going to be handled by the main lines of a bus rapid transit system, and the short hauls and, and connections to the main lines 
will be handled by RIDA. And all the jurisdictions that have done bus rapid transit have seen a transition from greater service provided on the main lines and a shrinking of local bus networks in terms of the length of their runs and the time of their runs. So this is a necessary part of the work we're doing. We're also included money in the budget for the Brookfield Bus Depot. It's an electrification project, includes a microgrid, and we're also adding two portable solar-powered electric vehicle charging stations. Next. We're working to improve economic development. So working with our Economic Development Corporation, we've got an entrepreneurship development focus. Uh, there's an Entrepreneurs in Residence Fellowship Program. There's an Inclusive Economy Initiative, and there's a Talent Pipeline Workforce Development Partnership, which are key elements of making sure that we train and develop our workforce to fill the jobs that exist in Montgomery County and the region that are currently going unfilled. The thing I'd like to focus on more than anything is the proposed White Flint Research and Innovation Center. This is the first time since the county did the Life Sciences Center in um, good decades ago um, that we're doing a purpose-driven, jobs-driven, um, county-led economic development project. We've partnered with WMATA for a joint development agreement on the White Flint Metro. We're focused on bringing both research um, in life sciences and also in the computing world, um, artificial intelligence and quantum computing to this site. Um, our goal is to create a vibrant center, not only for these two industries, but to promote the confluence of computing and biology, because if you go into labs today, you see more and more work being done on computers in conjunction with the wet lab work that they do. And this is an important way forward, and we wanna make sure that our industries are at the front and leading on this. We're also um, in conversations with several uh, academic institutions who are interested in a presence in the center. And one of the things we're talking about is making sure that the programs that we put there academically align with the needs in both life sciences and in, and in um, computing technology, whether it's cyber, or IT, we wanna make sure that we're able to provide the talent pipeline that the industries and businesses in Montgomery County need and that we can support that through our activities. In White Flint, the really good news is that a number of private developers are beginning to look at life sciences projects. In the White Flint area, I think all of us believe that this is our opportunity and this would be, as I said before, the first time that we're driving a purpose-driven economic development program since we did the Life Sciences Center. So I'm excited about this, and I think um, it's gonna pay benefits to the county for a long time to come. The jobs that we generate there will be decent paying jobs. Um, the jobs that we generate will spur um, housing growth, which has been stagnant along with gr job growth in this county. And as we build more jobs, and, we, and the population increases and our tax base increases, we're gonna be building more housing to provide places for these people to live. Um, we, need, we have an inclusive economy initiative, as I said, and we're also looking at building incubators, not just the life science incubators, but incubators um, similar to like Baltimore's Open Works that provide job opportunities and skill training um, for people at, um, at different levels of the economy. So we're looking at economic development from top to bottom, from our current workforce and the people who live here now to what the future is gonna look like and what kind of workforce we're gonna to need to develop for that future. Next slide. We're adding a million dollars to the funding of the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. And this budget includes a little over 800,000 to the Conference and Visitors Bureau in order to offset projected hotel and motel tax shortfalls which are pretty understandable given the impact of COVID on that industry. We're building a more equitable county. Um, we're putting additional resources and personnel for the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. We're providing funds for a mobile health clinic to address health disparities. Again, you know, one of the things that's become painfully clear in COVID, you can make vaccines available, you can make testing available, not everybody can get to the testing sites or vaccine sites. 
So we are um, doing work in mobile health care, and we're going to continue that. The county, for this first time, is creating a, a multilingual and multicultural communications unit. This is going to provide resources so all county agencies can effectively communicate with our diverse community. Um, it's something that people have talked about for a long time. It's been very important on people's agenda list, and we are moving it forward. And we're providing um, funding to close the digital divide. We actually um, have provided um, internet services to an apartment building that houses uh, largely a, um, a disabled community right next to the county office building. And our um, IT folks are working on extending um, internet connection to apartment buildings in parts of the county where we have a where we have a more low income population that lacks access to internet. We know this has come up in the schools, and so we're making sure that we can connect as many people as possible, um, so that the, we can begin to erase the digital divide. And I'm encouraged that there's money in the uh, in President Biden's uh, proposals to also help address the digital divide. We look forward to partnering with them so we can make sure that everybody in Montgomery County gets the access they need and uh, that we all move forward together. We have record funding for affordable housing in this budget. We have 61.1 million in the Housing Initiative Fund. We have 22 million for affordable housing acquisition and preservation CIP project. And we've got $6 million for a new affordable housing opportunity fund. In addition to the things that are in the budget, we are putting an increased emphasis with our partners on moving from providing rental housing to looking at providing more ownership opportunities. There is no way that we're going to address historic inequalities in this community. And it's not just Montgomery County. This is clearly a national problem. These will not be addressed if we do not provide opportunities for people to build equity and get ownership in housing. If all we produce is rental housing, we pretty much guarantee that people never realize the equity of their investment. They will not be able to borrow against their houses for things like college tuition for their children or for a bigger house when they need one. So we wanna make sure that we start focusing on providing equitable opportunities to building capital in this community. And uh, I'm continuing to work with the nonprofits to move this needle forward. Next. We're increasing the Working Families Income Supplement Program by $20 million. We're including $5 million for residents with a taxpayer identification number who previously were not eligible for this program. We're enhancing funding for our hubs by $3.6 million. They will continue after the pandemic. We're working with the nonprofits and with um, Health and Human Services to come up with a new um, program for these um, hubs as we emerge out of COVID. We're expanding our rapid rehousing programs and rental assistance programs. And there's money in this budget um, for the purchase of a building and the renovation of a building to provide year-round um, space for homeless people so that we can begin to end the long-standing and regrettable county policy that eight months of the year homeless people sleep outside. Our goal is within a couple of years to have enough space converted that we can make sure that anybody who wants a bed inside and a room inside can have that and that we don't accept that our homeless population has to sleep outside eight months a year. We're including an additional $5 million more for early, chair, early care and education initiative. Uh, we made a commitment early on to expand um, child care and early childhood education. The total of funds now will be in the FY22 will be available, that will be available, will climb to $12.5 million with this $5 million advancement. And we're reimagining public safety. We've eliminated 29 positions from the police department. We're creating three new mobile crisis outreach teams in addition to the three that we should have standing by the end of this calendar year. Um, we're maintaining and expanding funding for mental health programs for youth. And we're establishing a homeless court in Montgomery County. It is time for us to decriminalize homelessness. Um, 
treating homeless issues, things like littering, which can lead to a ticket, which can lead to a court appearance, where if you don't appear in court, um, you wind up getting arrested, and then you wind up with the arrest record, which then makes it impossible for you to get employed. We need to break that cycle. We need to deal with homelessness as a social problem as it is. We need to move from tickets to citations, and we need to move to services rather than jail. And so this is the work we're gonna do. We're working on finding resources, identifying resources for a restoration center. And uh, I think the, uh, the other thing I wanna mention is we are um, in the fall, SROs will not be, we will not have the SRO program. Um, the SROs will not be in schools. We are um, taking a very different approach. The state requires us to have a response plan for the county schools. We are gonna take police officers. They will have beats that include the wider areas um, that, that would encompass the different school districts and they will not be stationed in the schools. If there's an issue that, you know, a crisis that requires a police officer, they'll be available for response. But we wanna to move toward bringing more, uh, more appropriate responses into the schools. One of the things we hope to be able to modify in this budget as it moves forward is to identify some additional funding to put social workers in all the high schools. We think this is important because of uh, some cuts in uh, funding levels that came late to our budget. These are some of the things, as well as, for example, getting another building we could convert for homelessness that we weren't able to do immediately, but we're looking for ways to do that. And our intention is to increase our support for our students, provide the flexibility of responses other than police officers, unless they're otherwise absolutely necessary. And uh, we think this helps move us forward. There are other steps, steps in reimagining police, which aren't budgetary things. They go into training, what we're trained for. Um, you'll be seeing uh, some additional announcements from us on policy matters in the coming weeks. So stay tuned, but there's more to come. Um, with our community partners, all the nonprofits that we work with, uh, we've made inflationary adjustments in their budgets for the nonprofit providers under contract to HHS, for the medical adult daycare providers, for the developmental disability service providers, grant funds to, our, to arts and humanities organizations through the arts and humanity councils. We've, made funding, we've maintained funding for the FY21 community grants recipients. So the grants recipients in FY21 um, will be getting funding this year as well. And we're moving 23 community grants into the base budgets of the departments. These are programs that are uh, essential enough that we're ready to move into the base of the county budget. We're also fully funding the county's um, recommended public, public election fund at $3 million. We have additional support for MC311 to reduce our call wait times. We're revising the methodology for municipal tax um, duplication. This has been an ongoing issue between the municipalities and the county government. I was on the uh, city council of Tacoma Park in 1987, and this was a festering disagreement going back that far and beyond. Um, we've reached an agreement and uh, we'll be moving forward with a two year um, installation of that agreement. And we've identified positions for elimination, elimination as part of efforts to improve efficiency and effectiveness of our programs. We didn't get as far as we planned because COVID interfered with our ability to bring people together into workspaces and to have the conversations we wanted to have but we've begun having those conversations virtually. They've been going on now for a while. We're focusing on identifying positions where either redefining positions, redefining workflows, and adding appropriate technology can allow us to reduce the total number of positions that we use in order to provide both improvements in efficiency and savings. And for those of you who may never have seen this, um, <clears throat> I'd invite you to look at some of the work being done by Michael Baskins. Um, we are running cohorts of our employees um, through a program where we give them some training and then we 
charge them with ident identifying a problem in their department that they feel needs to be solved. And we give them the tools and the support to come back with program programmatic suggestions on how to relieve bottlenecks, how to make their departments more efficient, how to address particular areas where they see these problems. And then we move forward and we'll be implementing the programs that that actually demonstrates savings and improvements and efficiency. It is, it is a wonderful thing to listen to these folks make their suggestions. It really gives them an opportunity to feel like they're being listened to. It gives our county workers a greater role in shaping the workplace. And I'm a big believer in that. I think that nobody knows the work process better than the people who do it and that if we want suggestions for how to make the work processes more effective and more efficient, we need to go to the people who are doing the work and saying, how can you make this better? Our folks are willing and able to help us and we're prepared to provide them the opportunities to do that. At the end of the day, all of us are gonna benefit and the county benefit will, will follow down to the bottom line of our budget. Our reserves fell below the 10% level in terms of maintaining reserves because of the county's COVID response. We had to spend money to keep the county open. But the really good news is that, you know, we were, we will be able to, by the end of 2022, our budget will leave us with a 9.6% reserve and a three-year plan to get to the 10% by FY24. Um, this is important to the county's bond rating. Um, a lot of people were worried we would not get here. Um, we got here. And I'm really proud of the work my staff has done and all the work we've done through the budget to make some really difficult decisions that let us, that let us get to this point. But we think we're in a good place moving forward. And uh, I think this is good news. And uh, hopefully the bond agencies will feel the same way. This is a you know, quick overview of um, total expenditures by service area. You'll get this all in your, what we send out to you, but you get the picture of public schools. Number one, 46.6% of the budget, public safety, police, fire, um, emergency management, all, all the public safety things at 10.5, other government functions at 7.7, .7, debt service at 7.5, and then human services, Montgomery College, transportation, general government, park and planning, environment, housing, and libraries and recreation. The money comes largely from the property tax. Close behind that is the income tax, transfer and recreation tax, other taxes, charges for services, intergovernmental transfers, fines and miscellaneous um, revenues, um, in prior year reserves. This are all the things that go to make up where the sources of our money are. And the final thing is, where does the money go? And this is the big picture. County government takes 38.6%. Public schools take 44%. Montgomery College takes 5.3%. National Park and Planning Commission takes 169 million, 2.5%. Non-agency uses that aren't visible on the chart are 0.1% and reserves are 636 million, 9.5%. The total recommended use of funds, 6,693,700,000 dollars. And that is the budget. Okay, um, that, thank you very much, County Executive. Uh, we'll now open the floor uh, to questions if we have some from the media and I'll look here to see if we have any. Um, our first question is from Rebecca Tan from the Post. Thank you for having me. Um, I have, a, have two big questions for you, uh, County Executive. First, can you say, you know, overall is, is Montgomery County Police Department's budget increasing or, or decreasing overall? Jennifer, what's the, what's the actual total? The number of people are down. Um, we're making this 20, you know, the, the reduction of uh, people that were shown 
in the slide that the only two positions we added to the budget were for um, for the internal affairs because one of the problems the department has it takes an incredibly long time to process complaints you know we've seen a number of high profile incidents where the work the department took just to make a finding was almost a year and so they've said that they have a lack they've had a lack of personnel to deal with it so we're providing two people to deal with that so I don't know the inflation puts or takes on operating and expenses. And uh, there is, you know, um, I think there's a, a small um, pay increase in there. So I don't know the net. I don't know if Jennifer could tell you that. Um, Ms. Or Rich. I don't have that information right off the top. We'll get it to you. I'll certainly get it to you. Okay, thank you. And of the 29 positions, uh, you said in your memo that, that some were vacant. Um, are you able to say exactly how many of the 29 positions were already vacant? They were vacant and going to be filled, and no, no they're not going to be filled. Um, so it's actual money that we're not going to be spending that we thought we were going to be spending. Got it. I think and there's a change. Uh, I think there's some SRO positions that got taken out. I think it was the middle school SROs um, are out of, as well. Got it. You see, you, when you see the budget, you can go find the details of it. Got it. And, and for the SRO program, just so I understand, uh, the, the offices will be removed from the campuses of the schools, but will be redeployed to the community surrounding it. Is that right? Well, the community surrounding, but it's the community surrounding the high school, the middle schools, and the elementary schools of the cluster. So they have, a, they have a lot of neighborhood ground to cover. They will not be stationed in the schools. They're not gonna be parked in the parking lot. They're not gonna be walking on the grounds. They will literally be out in the community available to the schools. What the, you know, what the state law envisioned was if you didn't have SROs, you had to have a response plan and telling them that call the police and the police will respond was not enough of a response plan because I guess based on other incidents, you know, and you got to remember the nexus or the genesis of this was largely the response to school shootings was taking too long for officers who were on beats uh, to arrive there. So we're shrinking the set of beats, we're providing uh, the ability of officers to rapidly respond and not have them detail to traffic duty or doing other things that might otherwise make them avail unavailable when they were needed. And can you briefly say why you decided to do this, to take the officers out of the schools? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer that we need to put more social service supports into the school. When I was on the council, I always expressed my misgivings about, you know, focusing on a police response rather than focusing on a social worker response or a school psychologist response. You know, I was a teacher and I knew that, you know, we were you know, we were way understaffed and well below national standards and where we should be with mental health um, supports in the schools. And, you know, ultimately these problems are best handled by somebody other than, than the police officer. And, you know, while it's good that, you know, some students find it helpful and useful to be able to talk to a police officer, mental health services are generally provided by mental health um, professionals, students who need support, um, really should be able to get help that way. So I think this is in general part of our effort to make sure that non-police responses are provided or are supported by non-police resources. Got it. And final question, you know, given the pandemic, I'm wondering, are you proposing any significant funding uh, additions to the to public health agencies and specifically health and human resources in the realm of infection control and pandemic response? So let's see, there's $5 million for childcare that wasn't there before. We are buying and renovating a building that's gonna cost us more than $5 million um, for homelessness. There are, we fully funded the school budgets, including maintenance of effort um, for both public schools and everything that Montgomery College asked for. We are putting more money into climate change um, including whether you know we're continuing to purchase electric 
vehicles, but we're also providing human resources and climate change to actually do the work in the community. Uh, I think as you go through the budget, you'll see we actually tried to prioritize things we knew were high value. We have um, this whole multicultural, multilingual team that didn't exist before because we have to do a better job. And this has been an issue that was raised back when I was on the, on the council of communicating with people with linguistic and cultural differences. So we made a major investment in that. So there, there are things that you know, we decided to invest in that reflect you know, not just my values, but reflect issues that have been consistently raised you know, by members of the council, language, homelessness, all these things have been issues that have been addressed by the council. More money into economic development, um, development and revitalization of our incubator programs, which have really not really functioned the way they needed to function historically. Um, so yeah, we were able amidst all this to actually move forward. This is not a retreat budget. This is not a um, same services budget. This is a recovery budget moving Montgomery County forward, not treading water. Thank you. Ms. Tan, I just wanted to follow up on your question. Um, it was responded to in the chat. The police budget had a very minor increase of $1.6 million, which represents about 6% increase. I mean, 0.6% uh, increase in their budget overall, over FY21 approved. Thanks. And the entire budget document is now available online on the county's website under under open budget. Save paper and view it through your PDF. Your <laughs> Thanks. Next question we have is from uh, Kate Ryan from WTOP. She has a question uh, for the county executive. Thanks. In terms of the SRO program, uh, did you speak to the chief about these plans? What, what was his he sense on the, this? He brought over the plan. When did he do that? Um, within the past few weeks. Okay, okay. And then in terms of um, the services for homeless and, and your efforts to keep people from having to sleep rough or sleep outside, um, how many people do you see this, uh, foresee this serving? They think that the first building could handle about 200 people. Um, I'm not you know, exactly sure on the number. They've got renovations to do inside. Um, so, you know, just to be, you know, frank, I mean, my goal is to have multiple buildings because 200 is too many in one building, but 200 people sleeping inside is better than 200 people sleeping outside. My hope is that we get several of these buildings and that we're able to convert them into more individual living spaces so that everybody is not cot to cot or mat to mat. Um, so people can have some privacy and a little bit more dignity in their living conditions. And uh, we're hoping, I had a conversation with one of the nonprofit food providers, one of the very big ones, and said, if you had those many people in, a, in one place, they could help bring food there. And I would love to be able to bring food so people don't have to go out and panhandle, try to get money to raise food or panhandle for food. The more humanely we can treat people, the more we can give them options at, you know, decent life opportunities, the more chances we're gonna to have to work with them and, you know, particularly help. So many of these folks are, you know, are homeless because they lost a paycheck or they got stuck with a car repair that they couldn't manage and then they lost a the job. Um, we need to make sure that we can get these folks recovering and back to the workforce to the extent that so many of them could do that. We need to facilitate that transition. Got it. And That's then- what a quick follow up on the um, on the FEMA reimbursement. It seems that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the budget uh, proposal is predicated on the belief that you will be fully reimbursed by FEMA. How confident are you that that's the case? And how many dollars are we talking about there? Richard, Jennifer. So we are we are assuming um, about. Uh, we've already received $31.8 million from FEMA, and we're assuming um, another $74, $75 million at this point 
in FEMA reimbursements for the spending that we've already done. Remember, um, since uh, maybe the one of the, uh, the well, remember the Biden administration has announced that FEMA will now be reimbursing 100% of eligible costs, not 75% right. of eligible costs. So that has made more of our spending um, um, eligible for funding. And the proposal that you have before you, before you at the county executive's direction has a conservative estimate for FEMA reimbursements. We will be asking for a lot more than that, but we wanted to not build out a budget that assumed um, an even greater amount of money. I mean, we will we will have requests in far in excess of this amount, but we wanted to be reasonable in building out a budget what we would uh, what we would assume. Terrific. So, and we okay. will be working very hard with our congressional delegation and with the Biden administration to make sure we get every penny possible out of FEMA because that just means more money right back into the community to help with um, response and recovery. Thank you. And I apologize. It looks like Randy Bass was in line not only before me, but before <laughs> Rebecca. So uh, Randy Bass is waiting. I, I didn't see that. Sorry, sorry about that, Randy. Um, so next question is for Randy Bass, WDVM. No worries at all. Thanks so much for taking my questions and having me on the briefing this afternoon. Uh, County Executive, what particular projects or initiatives are you looking forward to seeing come to fruition or putting into motion heading into FY22? And which of these new initiatives do you expect to see making a clear impact, a, a very visible impact on the lives of Montgomery County residents as soon as, as it gets going? Thank you for that question. Um, I wish I had a notepad and scribbled, scribbled down what I was thinking. So here's some big things to me. Dealing with homelessness is a big issue to me. I mean, it, it is, I'll say shameful that the county's policy for decades has been people sleep outside. We have too many resources and too much ability here to do that. And we need to find solutions. And it may be that, you know, an economic, an economic downturn that, produces some empty space may well be space that we can use to, to address this. So that's really important to me. I think the reimagining police work is, is really, really important. I, you know, I've, I've felt pretty strongly that, you know, we've, we've dumped on the police department a whole bunch of social problems. We've made the police our response to social problems, drug abuse, alcoholism, mental health issues. And we just need to say, these need to be treated by the right resources and the right departments, and people need to get help. And I will say, you know, I'm, it, it, it continues to be troubling that when you look at some of the, you know, the incidents that resulted in fatalities, we are clearly dealing with mental health issues. We didn't, you know, we had one mental health response team. The odds of them being able to arrive any place in the county in a timely manner would be pretty much slim and none. This will get us six response teams that are out in the community that can be available um, in a much more rapid time frame. We have to train call takers to be able, be able to identify, um, you know, what is an appropriate police call and where do you need to call in a mental health team to support. Uh, our folks are being trained by CAHOOTS. A lot of people um, like the CAHOOTS program that was out of Oregon. Um, we, we've had citizen groups look at it and it was highly recommended. So we're looking at, they're, well, they're not, look, they're not looking at it, they're actually doing training for us um, in the CAHOOTS model. So that excites me a lot. Um, the development in White Flint, I think is absolutely critical. If you've seen the reports that we've had in Montgomery County, um, we have been stagnant, flat stagnant on jobs for 10 years. 10 years. It's a long time. And, you know, I'll just say this, you know, somebody who lost a lot of votes on zoning, people would say, you know, we got to rezone all this and jobs will come here. Well, we rezoned a boatload of stuff, did massive density, and no jobs came here. We need a jobs plan. We have two major industries that we can play off of. One is life sciences and one is all the combined aspects of computing. And artificial intelligence and quantum computing are going to be the next thing, and they have implications for everything in society, all manner of work, all manner of technology. 
is going to find roots in that. This is an opportunity for us in an area that we've got strengths to build on and develop. We know increasingly that companies want to be in spaces that are um, more urban and more connected. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I learned the word con collision space. I can assure you that three years ago, collision space was not in my vocabulary. I would have thought a collision space is a bad intersection where two cars come together. Um, collision spaces are things that people really value in terms of a work environment where um, people can get together, they can get lunch together. Um, things that you can't do in all the centers in Montgomery County, particularly the large centers where buildings are spread out. So when people talk about a Kendall Square, um, San Jose and some of the other places that they cite as uh, places with of centers of activity, we want to make sure that we can produce that. The White Flint Metro Station, obviously the largest undeveloped metro station with lots of available land on the red line, right down the street from the Life Sciences Center where we have you know, a, a wealth of amazing companies that uh, are making their mark in the world and leading the way in COVID. And right up the street from NIH, get on the Beltway, hop around to FDA. It is ideally located. We have a naturally occurring triangle here and we're gonna build on it. And that will bring us jobs. The jobs will help drive housing. And, you know, my goal is to get us out of these doldrums. Um, a lot of developers have made the point that without jobs, they don't have the demand for housing to justify going forward. People forget that the housing we don't have is already in all the master plans. We did a massive rezoning of White Flint, a massive rezoning of White Flint too, um, massive rezoning of Wheaton, you know, Twinbrook. I mean, I, you could list all the places, White Oak, of all the places we did massive rezonings. There's plenty of zone property to build housing, plenty of zone property to build jobs. They're not coming. We need a jobs policy. The jobs policy will help drive that growth and get us where we not want to be. And it'll build our tax base, which is critically important. So those are the things I'm really, really excited about. The climate change stuff this is a long answer, but you asked me. Uh, the climate change stuff is really important to me. We set really ambitious goals. When the council said it, we didn't set any plan. We just said, this is our target. Um, so I inherited the target, I voted for the target, um, but I knew when I was voting for the target that not every answer was there, because if we knew every answer, we would have put it into the plan in the beginning. Um, some of these things are evolving, but I'll give you an example. This, this thing with the bus leasing, for you know, a couple of years, we were wondering how the heck do we transition our bus fleet in our cap within our capital budget? How do we do this? The leasing solution proves to be a way that we can make these advances. We've done similar stuff on building upgrades with HVAC systems, where we can pay for them out of energy savings. So doors and ideas are beginning to open that weren't open before. Um, I'm really optimistic about our ability to move forward. And, I, and part of it is that key industries are changing. The auto industry is going to go all electric. You know, it's just a matter whether it's 2025 for some companies or 2035 for other companies. But this evolution is going to happen. The evolution is occurring in trucks, including big trucks. So the world's changing. We're in a good place in a changing world. And uh, we're going to do our part to drive that change. We've got new building standards that will set higher bars for new construction. And we have building standards that are going to require older buildings to come up closer to what the new standards are. So that's a lot I'm happy about. And I'm actually I'm really happy that the schools did not have to take a cut in any of this. We're fully able to fund our educational system. There's more, but that'll do for now. Thank you very much. Okay, um, our neck, if you don't mind, Kate, I'll, uh, I'll go to Brianna and come back to you since you have a follow-up question. Yes, yes, sure. Okay, so Brianna from uh, Bethesda Beat, if you can uh, go ahead and ask your question to the county executive. Yes, thanks. I just have a clarification question. Um, first, about the police reorganization. Um, I know that those positions are going to be cut and those employees who are 
in certain um, positions that are being cut will go to uh, be reassigned to other positions. Um, could you say how many people are being reassigned, reassigned and is that creating a new position or are they filling another vacant position? I think the only two new positions are the, um, the ones in the investigative unit. Um, the one new position we're going to fill this year is the civilian assistant chief of police. Okay, so they'll be reassigned to yep. Every vacant people positions. get reassigned. And frankly, okay. we're looking to do this in other departments too. Okay, and um, the other question I had, uh, just to clarify, um, I know the Board of Education's request was for $2.8 billion. The county is covering $1.8 billion of that, correct? Or not? We're covering everything they asked us for. Okay, I just, I had a question about, because um, in the budget summary, it says um, this budget fully funds Board of Education's request for $2.8 billion, including $1.8 billion from the county. I just want to make sure I'm... Right, so we have to We have to appropriate all of the funds technically for the school system. So the state dollars that come to the to MCPS have to be appropriated by okay. us right. in order for them to spend those dollars. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Okay, um, Kate, back to you for your follow-up question. Thank you, and actually, Brianna kind of um, anticipated, I just want to make sure, the original um, that I remember seeing is what, 29 positions twenty in the police department, 25 of those were sworn officer positions, all 29 that are being taken out of the police budget, out of the budget, go back into the police department, correct? They're all, re in other words, the 25 SROs go back into different positions within the police department. But do I have that right? 29 total, 25 of those were SROs? Yes, all the people remain in the, they would just be moved to other officer positions within the department. So that the, they will be moved to vacant positions that might be in, um, in the, in field services in the different districts. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions from our friends in the media? Going once, going twice, going three times. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us for our 2022 uh, budget recommended budget presentation. I want to thank the uh, county executive for his time, our uh, chief administrative officer, Rich Manolino, and our uh, director of the Office of, of Management and Budget, uh, Jennifer Bryant, for being here. Um, and I'll, I'll say it uh, on behalf of them. Also want to uh, thank the OMB staff and others for the tremendous time and energy they put in uh, to putting this budget together. Uh, a budget, as the county executive said, um, was a lot better than we thought it might have been uh, a year ago from today. So um, thank you very much for joining us. I don't know if you want to say any closing words. I just county wanted executive. to say something really quick. I'm, if I didn't say it enough before, I really want to call out the, the staff um, of the county government and, and Jennifer and the team you led in the OMB. It, it has been a very interesting and difficult year. And to have people who are constantly thinking about what we're doing and able to give us a sense of where we were and what the pitfalls were gonna be and what we needed to do was enormously helpful. And I know that you know, this is stressful for people. I know that as we were looking at numbers and wondering, you know, I'll be blunt, you know, we were very dependent on, you know, actually electing a president who had some sense of obligation uh, to people in, in this whole country and who had understood the traumas that, you know, people like, you know, in Montgomery County had experienced. Um, Montgomery, every county government, every state government has been hit by this. And if they had been left to flounder on the damage done by COVID without the federal government stepping in, it would have been, it, we'd be a very different country. We'd be looking at, you know, a major retreat from the efforts that people have spent decades spending, 
trying to move this country forward. And the federal money is, is an investment in making sure that, you know, America can be what we want America can be. It means that Montgomery County can be what we want to be. And I just want to make sure that, uh, that people understand that I understand the role that other people played in helping make the work that we did possible. So I want to thank everybody for that. Okay, uh, that ends our, our press briefing. We'll look to see you all uh, this week as we do our uh, COVID uh, press briefing, I believe on Wednesday. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, certainly feel free to reach out um, and we'll connect you with whomever you need to to talk about uh, the budget. Thank you. <laughs>